I am the guest appraiser today, and I'm very excited to be here. Havana says it is the friendliest town in Florida, and I have a hunch that that's true from the people I've talked to so far. Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. <laughs> That's great. It's a beautiful piece. Oh, I want you Hello, so I'm ready when you are. If you want to take it out, we'll go ahead and uh, take a look. It's pretty when they're all together. Oh, and it's got the tray too. Well, that's nice that you have the entire set. Mm -hmm. And I usually set them around the tray. How did you get this and have you ever looked at it or have any idea about it? Um, I was, my dad, we like going to auctions and stuff. So we were at an auction and he bought that. My friend like many years later my friend worked at an auction he's like oh that looks like depression glass and i was like don't even know what that is yeah and so we took it to his work and to put it under like i guess what the black light uh-huh what y'all well i only took one of the little cups and did it glow? It did glow. Ah, uh, neat. So yes. I haven't seen the whole thing glow, but I know one of the cups glows, and I don't know which cup it was. But well, if one goes, the chances are that they probably uh, all yeah, do. Yeah, I figured that. Yes. The reason so, it glows is because they would, to get this sort of yellowy green, they would oftentimes use just a little bit of uranium salt or uranium oxide in it, and that would give it that yellow green color rather than forest green or a dark green. Mm -hmm and it would just brighten it up. And it's not bad for you once it's not heated. When it was heated, it gave off vapor, so you didn't want to work around it. But once you get to the point where it's like this, you're just fine. Um, this is a pattern called sandwich. And sandwich originally, way, way back when, in about the 1820s, when they started making glass in the United States, mm -hmm. the Boston and Sandwich Company in Massachusetts started doing patterns very similar to this. And it was like the first pattern glass made in the US. Well, then collectors started really getting into pattern glass in the early 1900s, and by the 1930s and 40s, they were collecting it enough that some companies said, hey, let's do molds and styles that look like that again, and that's about the time that uh, they started making this again. And they did it all the way through the 1970s. There was a company called Tiara Home Parties, uh, where you would, it's sort of like, you know, Avon or Tupperware, where you'd uh -huh. take things to people's houses and sell it, but they would sell glass novelties. It's a decanter with the glasses for serving, you know, little liqueur or cordials uh -huh. or port wine or that sort of thing. It's nice that it has the tray. Do you remember back all that way what your dad paid for it? Do you have any uh, remember? It wasn't much, remembrance? like 15, 20 bucks, yeah. probably. Yeah, depression glass was super popular, then less popular. But now this new generation of collectors is fascinated with anything that glows under a black light. So this is Indiana Glass for Tiara, this particular set, but it still has that green glow. And because of that, they're selling anywhere from $85 to $125 a set now. It's clear or another color, it'd be half that price. I only found it in one book. Uh, the un the uh, trivet for it is the one that shows in the book. So I know it's a lot larger than that is, yep. but that's the one it shows in the book, but it's a it's got a pie plate lid for it. Ah. Right. And the ivory apparently is the hardest one to find. It is. I've never seen a pie plate lid before. Yeah, no, it's it's unusual in a whole lot of different ways. And it's got the grooves underneath so that it will actually sit on there properly, properly which is that's great. Why, that's, why, that's why you can't turn it around face to face with each other because of the grooves. Because the grooves side. would hold it up. Yeah, but no, it's absolutely, it's Fire King. It's going to be late 40s, early 50s. It is the Philby pattern. Right. And it is uh, the most desirable. You see the pale blue most of the time. Yes, yes. And sometimes clear. Yeah. The other colors less. Now with the Fire King, I don't know that they're Custard glows under a black light. Some custard does and some doesn't. It depends. Yeah. And I think their shade tends not to. I haven't, I haven't really tried any Fire King under a black light, but that is a 100% goodwill find right there. Really? Fantastic. <laughs> so do you mind me asking how much? Uh, I bet we don't have $3 in it. Wow. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, it's a great set. 
A friend of mine who does glass shows had this years ago. Now the glass market was stronger right, then. Right. But when she sold this set, she sold it for $135. Yes. Mark appears to be Gorham, so it's yeah. American and it is sterling. And yeah, granted the sterling weight is probably only about 30 or $35, but mm -hmm. there is a premium for the fact that it is this old, that it's an interesting shape. And 59, honestly, is where I would have priced it as well. Really? Yeah, I think your price is just because right. I don't want anybody to turn it into a ring. I mean, imagine. Exactly. It, it, it would be neat looking, heart. but what a waste of a beautiful piece. To me, you do that with the stuff that's already bent and damaged. Yes, yes. You don't need to take this the good the stuff. This is the thing that... Um, ah, okay. Now, this is the King's pattern. Mm -hmm. Very famous old pattern. It's got the knight on it. Mm -hmm. Probably an olive spoon because of the deep well. Oh, that was a child's spoon. Oh, that does make sense. Yeah, no, I think sure. it's an olive spoon because it's to mm -hmm. be able to take one out. Although sometimes those have a hole in it, so it could also be jelly and jam. Uh, yeah. it's, it's verme, the, the gold wash on it, um, which is a gold plating, but that actually is something people like. I pull the drawers and I'm always looking for secret drawers. Right. Yeah. Secret doors are fun. And, yeah, and in it was these two pieces. Really? That I, you know, that I guess I didn't wow. know it was in there, so they were free to me. That's and great. I was fascinated with them. Well, this one has an English hallmark, the little mm -hmm. box there with the lion passant, and then the letter I. I don't see a maker mark. I don't think it matters much to the value of this one. The letter I would tell us the date, and I think this is going to be sometime around the early 20th or end of the 19th century yeah uh, so not quite as old as the other one but a great piece and pretty weighty actually and you have 47 on it uh, to me that's again I think you have a price just where it should be so those unknown things found in you know grandmothers right boxes. the what is it sir yes, yeah yes. but I've done a little bit of research oh yes on that. and what did your research tell you uh, Duncan Brothers mm -hmm. from 1890 to 1902, I yep. think it said. Yep. And it's an amberette. Very model. good. Mm -hmm. Daisy and Button. Daisy and Button, yeah. Ah, okay. Yep. These are the That's daisies. Okay. These are the daisies, and then these little patterns here are okay. the button. So okay. yes, it's Daisy and Button and Duncan. Duncan ended up being Duncan and Miller, and they were in production up until I think about 1970. They made okay. really good quality glass. Um, the amberette is interesting because they um, uh, it looks like a fired on color, but I believe it actually was solid um, where the amber was, which was a little bit of a trick for them to make. So this wasn't the easiest thing to make back at the time. Hmm. And the, um, the interesting thing with this piece is that it doesn't have any chips, and they usually do just from use, but Duncan was really good quality, and one of the things they did so that their stuff would last longer is they rolled all the edges. So they tend not to chip as much as some of the other companies, hmm. and I think that's why they lasted longer and the company lasted longer because it was good quality. Um, this, was, this has been in a box for decades now. That helps too, yes. It's a nice little piece, and honestly, if you uh, like it, I would go ahead and use it. As long as you don't put hot liquid in there, you won't hurt it mm -hmm. unless you drop it. Not really our style. Not so your I style, really right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. It I is, love it. I think it's beautiful. It's very pretty, but it is fussy in a Victorian way. Right? Uh, and part of the reason for that, all this faceting, is that a lot of people still only had gaslight or candles. And so Victorian houses, you know, people look at some of this stuff and think, well, that's kind of garish or loud or busy. But that was because they wanted the light to reflect off of all these facets oh. because they needed the outdoor light to reflect does. through the house or else yes. the house would be really dim. So you see lots of faceting and design on Victorian. Pattern glass was one of the first things people really started to collect in America about 1930. And by the 1980s and 90s, a lot of those people were passing on and those collections uh, went on to be inherited. And so mm -hmm. those heirs didn't need to buy more because there were whole sets coming to them. So the market mm -hmm. really kind of got soft. The same thing has happened to depression glass in the last 10 years. But what's happening now is that we're starting to see younger people. Uh, I, I know there's a gal on YouTube in Las Vegas who's starting to collect pattern glass for herself. So I do think this is poised to make a comeback. Value on this is probably around $50 currently.
I don't even know what the metal is. It feels like it's almost steel because it's so heavy. Right, it's so heavy, but the reason it's so heavy is that it's actually, uh, it looks to me like it's a tin wash over copper. Right. And yeah. the copper base is what's so heavy. Okay. Uh, because when we feel silver plate, if silver plate is done on copper, it's always a lot heavier than if the silver plate is done on some other material. Right. The guy that I bought it from, he knew, um, she was from Iran, but her it was in her, her family. And it was from Persia before Persia became Iran. And I know Iran um, came into to the picture in 1938. Right, up until then it was, it was still, it was still Persia. called Persia, yes. So it was made, or it was from then, it was at least before 1938. And that makes perfect sense. The traditions are a little different in Persia than other parts of the Middle East, and this absolutely adds up uh, because the the detail here is very similar to what we see in a lot of uh, Persian and Iranian painting. Right. Uh, you'll see a lot of those little paintings where they do a mosaic uh, edge and then they hand paint usually on bone or that sort of material. Right. Uh, but Persia is really known for metalwork and the uh, copper work, so it makes sense that it's a copper base. Uh, the tin wash would be to give it a um, the impression of maybe being silver oh, and then okay. to give it a little more detail and right. depth. I think it is a, a fairly good value because of the size and because it's a little different than the things that we see and also because you know we're we're not getting along really well with that part of the world and right. so we're not getting a lot of antiques out of there. What we're getting is tons of rugs. Yes. <laughs> uh, because they're just, uh, there's a glut over there and now there's a glut here too. You know, it's the type of thing that the value is to someone who collects this sort of thing, but it's still more of a decorative piece. Right. It's not like people see enough of these to really have no. collections of them. It's more like this is a really striking thing I'm going to have on the wall and, and set up a scene around right. it. My first thought based on similar but smaller pieces that I've seen sell in the five to seven hundred dollar range is that this one maybe would be a thousand okay. to the right person. Right. Finding right. the right person for this, yeah. it's a very specific thing. Okay. So that might be a price where you have to sit with it a while. Right. But when you get somebody who understands this sort of decorating and style, uh, it will sell right. immediately because you just don't it's see the eye them. of the holder, exactly. Yeah. So this is Shakespeare's A Winter's Tale, and how did you get this? We probably got that in New Jersey as well. Oh, okay. Probably. I don't know. <laughs> well, it's English classics, and you can tell they made a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And, oh, out of Milledgeville, Georgia. 1890. Well... These are neat little booklets, and they definitely uh, were very popular, especially these small formats. You see a lot of this around the 1890s. It was, um, well, first of all, it was a time when there was a lot of immigration to this country. So uh, people are trying to learn English. They're trying to fit in. They want more information. And then at the same time, you have people who are English speakers who lived here who, this is right before we have compulsory education. So there's starting to be a thought of, oh, we need to have these things around to teach our children, that, that everyone's not gonna just work on a farm anymore. We need literature, we wanna elevate ourselves. And so little compendiums like this, especially you know big groups of them together, there were even door-to-door -door salesmen uh, in the teens and 20s who sold those little leather books and you would buy the bookcase and all the little books would come with it. And the whole sales pitch was, well, this is going to help your children, you know, do better in life. They're really neat. Like um, the encyclopedia. <laughs> like the encyclopedia. Because of that, there's actually a lot of these around. So they're not terribly valued. Uh, I would say, you know, 15 to $20. Now, this piece is the old blue onion pattern. That's very, very popular and famous. And let's see the mark. Ah, okay. This is New York... Mycin called in England. This is one of these things where nowadays people would copyright things so they couldn't get away with this. But Mycin came out with the blue onion pattern and it was really, really popular. And lots of other companies copied it. This particular one 
is called in England is the maker. Mm -hmm. So it was not made in not, Germany by okay. Meissen. It was okay. made in England by Calden to be sold in New York. Okay. The fact that they have just the stamp and then the England stamp underneath makes me think this is from about 1890 because in 1891 was when we passed the laws that said they had to put the country of origin on. We didn't enforce it with everybody at first, but we sure enforced it with England because they were the ones we were really mad at because every time our industries would start to gain traction, they would send a boatload of the stuff over, sell it for oh. less than cost, <laughs> put us out of business so that and they could keep their industry. Their then they could come back with wares. their next load and it would be more expensive. So we finally did something about that. Um, I think truthfully because it's an English blue onion piece even though it does have age and it's a nice piece I th I think that value is going to be tough to get I think you're right so what would you say I honestly would do probably about half that truthfully okay. uh, go ahead and open it up and yeah, show so me it, what you've got there it, somebody had this came with the with the thing and so somebody did some basic research I had done some of my own research as well uh, what really drew me to it was obviously looking at the box Mm -hmm. Clearly old. Obviously, it needs to be fixed up. Yes. Not in great shape. But uh, it's a, engraved with the name of a brigadier general from the Bombay Army. Mm -hmm. This no. wood piece here goes there. And this is supposed to go in that little triangular compartment. My guess is that this is some sort of like secretary type, like traveling secretary thing. I believe it is. I believe it was a lap desk originally. What's interesting to me and a little different that I'm not certain of is what this large cavity here would have been for. Yeah. It might have been writing it paper, like it for paper. <laughs> it, but it doesn't seem like a good fit and it seems a little more specific. So it may have been that he had some sort of like a surveyor scale or something that mm. would be a parallelogram that you would expand. Uh -huh. um, the fact that it's from Bombay makes perfect sense because these knobs here are absolutely what we see in India with uh, we see a lot of uh, particularly sewing boxes made mm -hmm. in India at that time where they're multi-level and you have bone around wood and they're very intricate uh, the sewing boxes can be several hundred dollars because they'll have lots of little implements and sewing mm -hmm. things this would be worth more if it had its original contents and you're right that it's a little rough but the more interesting part is we've got the engraving here. Yeah, so I had done a little bit of research. The, the word Bombay Army stopped being used around 1890. Yes. And the the guy here, uh, that little CB, he was knighted. It was, the, I think it was the Order of the Bath. And, oh. uh, and so I was able to date that somewhere, I believe around like the 1860s, 1870s that he received this order. Yes. The box does come down completely. Uh, you'd have to wiggle it a little bit. But, right, I'm sure it's a little um, warped. I mean, obviously when the contents left people just used it as a box and they didn't think about it right. and they didn't care much and that's why you've got staining and things but it is solid mahogany mm, uh, it's, it's, mahogany, box. it's okay. mahogany box it's nicely made you can see the hand inlays mm. um, again I'm, I'm inclined to think that this had to do with something regarding surveying because mm. you have these metal attachments on the edge to make sure that whatever happens to this box that the edges don't get broken it's interesting that you've done all this research actually that certainly makes my job easier yeah uh, um, so late no, that, no, that actually came with the box. So I had acquired it. Oh, I see. I had acquired it from a thrift store of all places. Really? And that came with the box, and I did a little bit of additional research on the guy. Put it from about 1870 to 1890, I think, for this. Oh, I'm of the same opinion, because uh, the hardware seems appropriate. Again, we the things I'm the most familiar with are the sewing boxes. A lot of those were done 1860s, 70s, 80s. I believe that's going to be the same era as this, just like you said. Uh, your basic information is really good, and that is what makes it more interesting. This is probably more interesting as a historical article mm -hmm. than it is valuable. Right. Um, now, you said you got it at a thrift store. Was that around here? Yeah, right around here from Goodwill. Uh, oh, got it fantastic. For $3. Wow. So, so you can bucks, find things at Goodwill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. That is a great thing. Well, my feeling about it is that condition <laughs> value is one thing, but importance is another. As far as value, I think the value is relatively modest because the condition, it's missing its contents, mm. that sort of thing. 
as a box that's probably a 50 to 75 dollar box okay. and, and it could be cleaned up you would not be hurting it if you wished to polish it mm -hmm. um you could even use a little i mean this water rings pretty deep but you could a little use a little bit of howard's restore mm -hmm. a finish and even out the finish i wouldn't try to make it perfect that's not really the point uh, but it could it could clean up and look better without hurting the value. The more interesting part is this person's background. I know you're into history, so right. you're not looking to sell this. Yeah. But if you were, the place I would start, honestly, would be to try to see if there's some society in uh, either England or India okay. uh, for people who served there. And people would have a direct interest in the stories and history of the people who were involved and that would be where you would find your ultimate customer okay. or if there's any surviving family and to them it would be worth probably double the regular retail price because they want it for a different reason. Hey everyone, I just wanted to take a quick break and thank you for watching this video. If you're enjoying it, please give it a thumbs up and leave a comment. Also, please do subscribe because then you can click that bell to be notified of future videos. We have membership packages. We appreciate the support of our super fans who help us do extra bonus content. You can check that out by hitting the join button below or clicking the link in the description. Check out our new channel, The Antique Nomad Live. We'll have a lot of fun there too. So check us out here on The Antique Nomad and also on The Antique Nomad Live. Now let's get back to this video. So I, heard that, I heard that it was my granny's grandfather's sisters. Aw, isn't she sweet? So she might have been a child in the 1880s. China heads do start being made about that time. They mm -hmm. become more prolific after that. What's great about her is that you're, and you're showing me all the right stuff. Um, she's got the porcelain hands and the porcelain boots and they're all in good condition. Mm -hmm. A lot of times those extremities get broken. Mm -hmm. She has a cloth body. She's got the very... Not, not her original clothing. Not her original clothing, but it seems like it's older clothing. It does not look like new. Um, my mother had a neighbor to make clothing for her. Goodness, this has been about 50 years ago now. Okay, yep, that makes sense because I see a snap on the back that mm -hmm. looks like a 50-year-old or 60-year-old snap. But what's but nice about old. it is that she she used something that was appropriate. It's mm -hmm. cotton. It's that kind of a print. They would have had these sort of calico prints. Mm -hmm. I mean, she got exactly the right fabric. It almost looks like the original. Mm -hmm. um, so she did a really good job. A lot of times when they're redressed, they use polyester. Or they, yeah, you yes. know, it's just all wrong. So this is right, and mm -hmm. that's really great about it yep you see the cloth body here so she's not a uh, kid skin sometimes they would make them out of leather mm -hmm. uh, but not so much the china heads in their day these were a little less expensive than the fancy french uh, fashion dolls but this mm -hmm. one is particularly well done in the face i just want to show that up close because she's got really good detail in the eyes. Some of these, sometimes these are not so well painted, but the lips are very precise. Mm -hmm. The eyes are really good. Mm -hmm. um, so this one was better quality. It had a number six on the back. Um, that doesn't really tell us much of anything, but uh, sometimes they have maker names, not usually so much the China heads, but there's the number six. That would okay. have been her stock number. She's not really proportionate. She's not so proportionate, but a lot of times they're not. They just used whatever body mm -hmm. they had, and then they put the stuff on. She's about as proportionate as any of them. So <laughs> um, the value on this in the right place should probably be somewhere in the 135 to $150 range. Mm -hmm. um, they used to sell for a little bit more, but the doll market is a little bit soft right now yeah. because um, now the dolls people are collecting are Barbies and that sort of thing because that's what people grew up with. But I think mm -hmm. these are wonderful and it's just great that she's in such good condition and was a well-made one because they really do vary in quality. Oh, how pretty. And you went to an antique show when you were 13 for the yeah, first time. Yeah, with my friends in Monticello, New York. Oh, how neat. Oh, that's a beautiful little piece. And do you remember how you, what they told you about it then or no, what you paid for it? I don't. I remember I didn't pay very much because I didn't have much. Right. Probably about maybe five or seven dollars. Yep. Not very much. Wow. Oh, that's such a neat story. Well, it it's had some problems, but 
I still want to know what it was. It does, but we'll talk about what it was first because I think that's the most important thing. This appears, uh, from what I can tell, it, it's Japanese, and I believe that it is from the Satsuma area, although it is not exactly what I associate with Satsuma pottery because the color of the clay is a little different, but there's a lot of other potters in the area around that. So I believe it's actually Japanese rather than European. Uh, partly because of the detail in the background. That was something they liked to do. They, they never liked to leave empty space in the field and they would tend to do, they're trying to kind of make it look like cloisonne with the painting here, almost like the wires. The birds are really beautiful the way they're done and it looks to me like a combination of um, hand painting and transfer wear. And it, you're right, it does have some condition problems. It was repaired at the foot at one time and it does have a few little chips around the edge, but I still think that this is aesthetic period around 1880, so it had some uh, it had some age when you got it, for certain, and a lot more now because we've all gotten there. And I just think it's very sweet. Now, condition does matter. Uh, it's not that it couldn't be restored. I don't think it's valuable enough to bother with that. No, I think I you just enjoy it the way it is. Plus, the story of I still have the first thing I got in an antique show too. It's not for sale. It's just for me. Exactly. It's More wonderful. It's wonderful. And in the condition it is, it's probably, you know, maybe a $25 to $35 piece as is now. But it's just a lovely little piece. If it was perfect, it'd probably be $50 or $60. It has any value, but I'd like to know what it's made out of. Okay, well, let's take a look. And I got excited seeing this just because the fellows had that box that I said, well, in India they make things this way. And my guess is India again because of the way it's made, mm -hmm. because of the fact that it has all this inlay, that's pretty typical. It doesn't have the herringbone pattern of ivory, and it is very, uh, it has a few little spots and speckles like bone does. It's very finely carved for that. You usually don't see this level of um, detail in carving bone because it's a harder material. So the other material you have here is real tortoise shell, and there, Nowadays, that wouldn't be allowed to be used, but back when this was made, uh, there was no restriction on that at all. So um, it's perfectly legal and fine to have it and to sell it. It's actually a good thing because you've already got tortoise shell, which because it's older you can sell, newer stuff you couldn't, but ivory has become really difficult to sell. So the good news is that you're not going <laughs> to run into any problems with good. that. As far as age, the inside, because of the felt, and the hardware that's used looks like late 19th, early 20th century. So I'm going to say to be safe, probably right around 1900. I think as it is, it's probably worth about a hundred and a quarter to a hundred and a half. If it were in better condition, I would think it would be worth about 250. Mm -hmm. And these are really cute. And have you had these looked at before? No. These were my mother's. Well, they're aesthetic period, and they're going to be 1880s transfer wear. They're English. The Edge Malkin and Company were makers of ironstone china in Burslem, Staffordshire, England, and that's where so much of it was made. Chang is the pattern. It's not surprising that it's an Asian pattern. Before the Europeans knew how to make porcelain, the stuff was all coming from Asia, so it tended to have an Asian quality. And then when they figured out how to make porcelain and they wanted to make transfer wear, the reason Blue Willow exists is because it was a tea wrapper, and they took the design right <laughs> off it and turned it into decals to make transfer wear. My little chicken, I don't have a battery for it. But I got the original box for it. Hen laying eggs. Yes, this is uh, based on a famous 1950s one. This one's Chinese. We've been buying this sort of thing. One of the first things we started importing from China when we started making up with them in the 70s were tin toys like this. And yeah. I think it does go back that far. I think yeah. it's early as Chinese import goes. And they were basing them on previous toys, so this would have been based on something 50s era. I usually figure they're in a $40, $45 range because the original ones are about twice or, or a little more than that. But it's, but it's it's identifiable, definitely, because I've had this piece before, and when it yeah. does have a mark, mm -hmm, when it has, and I've had, there's similar lines to this. They don't always have the woman's face in cameo. Bad, they actually sometimes have little floral cartouches instead, but when they have a mark, it is 
the old embossed typewriter key mark that says Weller. This is Weller oh, okay, Pottery, okay, okay. and it's going to be from about 1910. Okay. And uh, they did several variations on this little box planner. Yours is the Cameo. I think that one's the most desirable of them. And I would price her probably around 45 I like to help educate other people, so I like to take pictures okay. of what I'm doing along the way. It's not cleaned. Oh, that's okay. okay. It's. Uh, I, I tried one spot recently up here. Yes. And just to prove to my, there, just to right to myself that, that it, it could be cleaned plate. and it is silver plate definitely and it can be polished the trick with silver and silver plate is and it's exactly the opposite of what people think if you use it a lot and you handle it it doesn't tarnish if you leave it sitting in the air the air will tarnish it and so i have a friend who she had the old family silver plate and she never uses it and she spent hours polishing it and two weeks later it turned black again. She's like, I'm never doing that again. And I said, well, you got to use this stuff. <laughs> um, this one's neat because it's hammered. It's going to be 1930s. It says Viking. Oh, it's Viking, Viking plate. Made in Canada. That's right. It's similar to Farber Canada. Brothers. Yeah, this is Canadian made. And this would be probably around the early 30s because when the 30s came, everybody started because they thought it was going to help their economy. They all slapped tariffs on each other and it actually made the economy even worse and so the result of that was that every country had to make their own stuff because you couldn't get it from anywhere else anymore so Canada started doing silver plate oh, okay. uh, so this is going to be early to mid 1930s and it's nice that it's got the cap these are usually missing people would misplace them and then never find them again mm -hmm. um, you know they're not terribly valuable a lot of people don't like to polish so silver plate isn't as popular as it used to be but i still think it would sell for 30 to 35 dollars in a store okay okay i am definitely curious to see this <laughs> old sati store u.s yes. mail okay it is definitely curtis jure style and i noticed that on the tag I bet you looked all over trying to find that signature and didn't find it. Still a functioning store. That makes it a little more interesting because we're in the right area as well for someone to recognize. You might even be able to put three and a quarter on it because again, if it sells, it's going to sell to so it may sell to somebody who's like, oh yeah, I know this. Right. I live around this. I want this, or I remember I know when. A lot of people around here have mountain houses in North Georgia, which is where this is at. Yes, exactly. Yeah, if you get the right person and this will this will definitely sell and that's such a great story I'm glad to know that now the other thing that might be interesting is you might contact the old Sati store and ask them if anybody there remembers them they may have ordered this to sell there they may know who the artist is they may know exactly who did it and that might actually help you sell the piece okay. Hello. Hello. Well, then remember to watch him on YouTube. I have been. <laughs> so tell me about this and how you got it. Okay, when I was 12 years old, would have been 1965, I got it in a little secondhand store in Vero Beach, Florida. I think I paid $5 for it. Really? A Christmas gift to my mother. Oh, that's really neat. And you know, what's interesting is that at the time you bought this, this was actually pretty new. Carnival glass started being really collectible in the 1950s and Fenton and Imperial and all these companies that had made it in the old days said, well, you know, we've still got the molds and we still know how to do this stuff. Let's make it again. You can get dinnerware. You can get a, I actually just got an entire, like four boxes full of this and you can set an entire table with this stuff. Carnival in the 1960s it's actually a little shinier in the color. With Carnival glass, there's two colors. There's the color of the glass, which in this case is blue, and then there's the color of the iridescence, and people look at the different colors in it. This one has some gold. It goes to blues and purples. It doesn't really have any green tinges. Sometimes they do. The 1950s, 60s Carnival, it tends to be this shiny iridescence. On the earlier pieces, it was a little more muted. It wasn't quite as bright because they used different materials. Um, having said that, a lot of people like this particular piece. So you actually see the picture. I see it in green marigold and this color. Marigold's that orange. Uh -huh. And um, 
they're pretty neat and they do sell they're good quality i i think the value today is probably around 40 to 45 dollars your story is not my story <laughs> hey, come on up have a seat well this is a neat coverlet i can tell right away and i'm curious to hear your story about it uh it's unclear it's been in the family over 100 years my father dragged it around the country did he ever talk about it like it came from a family member well, or yeah i mean he came out of northern west virginia okay and i do know that it's made on a loom yep and pieced together because the loom was only so wide that's right yeah these were uh jacquard looms i believe they were called and they were invented in france around the 1830s I just saw a big display of these at the Henry Ford Museum in Detroit, and they are very interesting. The jacquard weaving, it was a loom, and that's why they're put together in pieces, just like you said. But it was able to do a continuous loom of a very tight weave in a way that hadn't been done before. And you start seeing multiple colors almost right away. These patterns where they have the stylization, this makes it a little bit more desirable. The only thing that would make this even better is some of the early ones have the name of the person who made it and a date in the corner. Uh, and I haven't looked. But I, I doubt this one has it because it'd be very prominent. It's usually a big oh, panel, oh, like oh. a big section of it. Uh, where they did that uh, but these were uh, these were something that were a really big deal to people in the early to mid victorian era they kept making them probably till the 1870s or 80s uh, the fact that they were from west virginia makes a lot of sense yeah. because that was an old enough place you would have seen them you do have a few holes in it which is typical um, they did they were delicious and moths loved them yeah. Uh, but it's not bad. The condition overall is pretty good. It's not really faded. It's not torn. Um, I would say in a shop you would probably pay $225 to $275 for one similar. His family came from Wales, but I don't. I think that this came out of out of the Virginia North. Uh, West Virginia area. I think so too or because southwestern Pennsylvania. It would that could have been there. There's a lot in that area, and it was very popular at that time. Uh, there were professional made ones and there were ones made at home and these geometrics were usually the ones made at home. And so that's the other reason I think it's American. Yeah. Okay. The folks who came and brought things for appraisals were fun and we had some neat stuff and a good time with it. And it was really fun for me to walk around the store. I think I spent more doing this than I made doing it, and that's okay because I'll sell the stuff I bought. I Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below. Click the bell to be notified when new videos upload. Leave a comment below and hit thumbs up to like this video. Links to our online social media daily posts and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at The Antique Nomad. Bye for now.